Would you be able to recognize it if you stumbled onto a rich ore deposit? Now we all know about gold and platinum, silver, that sort of thing, but what about other metals? Things that are valuable, but maybe not so well known, including things like copper or lithium or uranium or rare earths. Would you be able to recognize those? You know, those can be pretty valuable too. And how would you know? Well, I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and today we're going to be talking about valuable metal ores. We're going to go through different categories and things. And this video is going to show you valuable ores for a variety of different kinds of metals and related products. There are a good number of metals that are important and valuable to our high technology society and we need them and they're worth money. And it's not just like I say, gold and silver. Ores are natural concentrations of various metals and elements in the ground where the processes of just natural geology and the forces of nature combined to take uh, materials that may be just in tiny traces inside a rock and pull them out and concentrate them into an ore that can be mined and handled at a profit. Would you like to see some examples of some valuable ores and what they look like so you could be familiar with it? Well, I'll show you some examples and we'll get into it right now. We're going to start with, of course, the obvious, the precious gold, platinum, silver, and diamonds. So a rock you stumbled onto looks like this with loads of obvious gold in it. Uh, you, you don't really have any big problems. You're in great shape. But the truth is most gold ores don't look like this full of gold. Even if the ore you happen to find looks like this, which has a whole lot less gold than the last specimen, still you're in great shape. But again, most gold ores don't have any visible or at least easily visible gold in them. A whole lot of gold ore looks like this. This is a chunk of white vein quartz stained heavily with rusty brown iron and iron manganese that's black. And so you get, you know, this kind of an appearance. Now you could take a powerful, like a 10 times hand lens and very carefully go over the entire surface of this rock and you would never see a single speck of gold. But if you were to crush it down, because this is gold ore, if you were to crush it down to sand or powder size, really, and then carefully pan the crushed rock out, you would get a number of little specks of gold. And those little specks are hidden within the rock because, of course, you can only see what's on the surface. You can't see what's inside. Again, a whole lot of uh, gold ore looks like this, a quartz vein material, quartz vein ore. Very similar in appearance. However, a huge amount of gold ore in the United States, in fact, the biggest gold bearing region in the U.S. is in Nevada, and the most productive anyway, and it produces ores that look like this. This is a Carlin type ore. The gold can only be seen with a microscope, so you couldn't see it if you had a 10 times loop looking at it. And look at the sign. It says it only contains a little more than a tenth of an ounce per ton. It's a tenth of an ounce in a ton of rock. No wonder it's hard to see the little individual bits of gold. Another type of gold ore that's been hugely productive is this material. This is not a vein. It's basically a layer in a sedimentary rock. You can see the little pebbles that were once uh, gravel that made up this rock, but uh, after uh, long heat and pressure, it's just been squeezed into one solid rock. And this is the Witwatersrand gold ores of South Africa. It's produced millions and millions and millions of ounces for many years and still one of the great producers of the world. So this is also gold ore. Next, let's take a look at some platinum ore. Now, this rock doesn't look anything special or unusual. It's an igneous rock with crystals of the various minerals in it. But you can kind of see over on the left-hand side of the rock, kind of more toward the edge, there's some blobs of kind of brassy sort of yellowish material. Now, those are sulfide minerals, and that's what makes this ore valuable. It's those sulfide minerals in the rock. And those sulfide minerals have some nickel and some copper, 
but uh, are valuable mostly for their platinum group metals. In this ore, that means pl mostly palladium, but it also contains platinum and the rest of the platinum group metals in smaller amounts. Now, a lot of the richest silver ores have a kind of a sooty black appearance, but of course, there are plenty of other min minerals that are kind of a sooty black appearance as well. So just that appearance doesn't mean it's silver, but it could be. So here's a chunk of silver ore from a, a vein, a quartz vein with silver, and you can see the black sooty spots on this, especially in the middle there. And it's the same mineral as what I just showed you. It's a, a silver sulfide, very rich in silver content. These primary silver ores are often rich in other sulfides as well, in addition to just the, the silver sulfides. The last specimen I showed you had very little other sulfides other than the silver, but this has a mixture of both silver sulfides and a number of base metal sulfides. Sometimes near the surface, the silver ores can become oxidized, and you'll get products like this silver chloride and sometimes little wires of metallic silver. And finally, let's take a look at uh, diamond. Now, I know diamond isn't a metal, but it does kind of have an ore called kimberlite. And this is a natural diamond in its kimberlite host rock. And you can see the kimberlite is uh, basically a breccia, a rock made up of fragments of other rocks glued together. Next, let's take a look at the classic base metals, copper, lead, zinc. These are still used in large amounts in our society and they're important to us. And so especially copper is super valuable to us. We need copper in order to transfer electricity. You know, electricity is made at various plants, hydro plants, power plants, other things. But how do you get that out to the consumer? Well, <laughs> we got power lines all over both the up, older lines up in the sky and the newer lines all often go down in the ground, but even so, we still need copper. And so let's take a look at these classic base metals. Now, the vast majority of copper ores come in two types. Sulfides, like this calcopyrite, the brassy yellow, sometimes mistaken for gold, just like, a, uh, like pyrite is, like fool's gold, because of its similar color. But this is a copper iron sulfide. So while the sulfide ores tend to be metallic looking, the oxidized ores like this tend to be some shades of blues and greens. Here is another sample of some oxidized copper ore. Um, this is not turquoise, although turquoise is colored by copper. This is chrysocolla, which is another common copper mineral that makes up an ore. As far as zinc ores, the most common zinc mineral is sphalerite, and uh, ores with sphalerite can be very valuable. Uh, in this picture, the darker mineral on the left is the one that's sphalerite. And sphalerite comes in a lot of colors. I have pieces of sphalerite that are light yellow green. Uh, I've seen pieces that are dark red, and of course, lots of stuff that's near black like this. Next, let's look at lead ores. The most important lead ore mineral is this silver gray material that you can see in the photograph. It's called galena. It's lead sulfide. Now this is that same lead ore, galena, distributed through this chunk of rock. And it says silver lead ore on the bottom. And indeed, a lot of lead ores contain significant silver. Now it varies all over the map. There are lead ores with only tiny traces of silver, and there are lead ores with very large amounts of silver in it. It just depends on the individual ore and individual deposit. Okay, so let's take a look next at iron and the steel alloy metals. Now the steel industry is a huge one and we make all kinds of specialty steels from things like stainless steel to special high density or high tension steel, uh, steel that uh, is good for springs that has uh, you know resistance to cracking. And there's all kinds of different characteristics that we want to see in steel that we need different alloys to bring those characteristics out. And so we're gonna take a look at these, uh, iron, nickel, all of the rest of these. But one of the things I wanna to say too is a lot of these metals also have important high-tech uses. Nickel and cobalt, chrome and manganese, molybdenum and vanadium, they all have their other special uses in addition to steel. But they're both mostly used for steel alloys and so we're gonna take a look at them together in that vein. 
Here's a chunk of iron ore. It's called banded iron, and the banded iron formations yield the bulk of the iron ore mined across our planet. This is a piece of garnierite nickel ore, and the nickel in the green is what gives it that color. It's a product of weathering, but it does contain a good amount of nickel. This beautiful pink mineral is erythrite. It's an ore of cobalt. It's uh, an important cobalt mineral. Now, cobalt, uh, like nickel, comes in both sulfides and oxidized minerals, but the uh, colors of the oxidized cobalt can be very pretty. This is chromite, the most important ore of the element chromium. The green here does have some chromium in it, but uh, it is the black material that really is the ore. Chromium is very important, not just for plating car bumpers, but also for all sorts of other requirements, including it's a major ingredient in stainless steel. So this is an important ore, and it's found in and around ultra basic types of formations. This is the ore of manganese, and both the pink and the black contain significant manganese. It just depends on the chemical state of the, the manganese, what color it is. And, but all of it is manganese ore, both the black and the pink. And manganese is a very important element in many steel alloys. The gray here is molybdenum ore. Molybdenum is used in a number of different steel alloys, but it's also used as a lubricant and for a number of other purposes. This is patronite, one of the most common vanadium ores. And there's really not a visible vanadium mineral that you can see in this. It's just kind of a mixed material. And so there are actual vanadium minerals. This red-brown mineral is vanadinite, and it is a vanadium-rich mineral. It, it's just not common enough to be an important ore of vanadium. And finally, our last grouping, we're going to talk about the high-tech metals. These are uh, metals that, uh, you know, in many decades long ago weren't really used that much, but new industry has brought them to the fore. Uh, lithium, of course, is uh, something that's used in batteries and is a, a huge increase in our demand for lithium because of being able to store power and electric electricity in our devices and things. Rare earths, uh, rare earths make possible so much that we don't realize. Uh, everything from uh, electric automobiles to our computers all run with the important elements of the rare earth group. Now, rare earths is not just one metal, of course. It's a group of metals, and they often occur together because they have similar chemistry. And so when the natural forces of geology come together to concentrate them, they concentrate all of them. And so it's almost always treated as a group. But each metal has its own high-tech applications. And then, of course, uranium. Um, uranium has been around a bit longer maybe than these two as far as being important to our society, but uranium is uh, probably going to be used more and more in the future. Not so much in the United States because we just reject that stuff, but all across Europe, Japan, uh, and China, elsewhere, they're building nuclear power plants <laughs> all the time. In the United States, uh, we don't do that. But uh, elsewhere in the world, yeah, they do that. So uranium is important as a source of electricity for us. Let's take a look. This is the mineral spodumene. It's uh, an important ore of lithium. And uh, actually when it's clear and well colored, it can be a gemstone such as in kunzite or hiddenite. But it, when it's like this and opaque, it's an important ore of the element lithium. A lot of lithium minerals, uh, when they're weathered and leached, actually become water soluble. And so uh, some dry lake beds and playas like this can have significant amounts of lithium in them. This is Nevada and the United States' big source of lithium, what has been for many decades. It's a dry lake bed in central Nevada. They evaporate the brine from the bed and concentrate it and produce lithium chemicals. This rock is a rare earth ore. The orangey red spots in there are minerals, uh, basnesite, rich in rare earth metals. And this was ore from a mine at Mountain Pass in California, where in the United States was the world's biggest source of rare earth metals. And we provided our, our minerals to the whole rest of the world. 
Another important source of rare earths is this, monazite sand. Now this mineral occurs as tiny grains in a lot of different kinds of rock, and when the rocks weather and are eroded away, this uh, rich sand, in, rich in rare earths and other metals, is deposited in beach sands and layers in beaches, and it's mined and concentrated and processed throughout the world. This bright yellow uranium mineral is carnitite. It's a common ore and for many decades was mined quite extensively in the southwestern United States. These examples are from Utah. This black mineral is pitchblende. It's another important uranium ore that's mined in a number of different uh, deposits throughout the world. There are a few other rare metals that I haven't included on here, but most of them are found just in traces, things like rhodium or something like that. But there's really not the thing as rhodium ore. Rhodium is you're part of the platinum group metals, and so when they mine platinum or palladium, um, you get a little tiny bit of rhodium with it. So some of these things where there's just traces of it in, and there's not really an ore that you would find, and there's no known ores for these metals, it's all just traces in other ores or other rocks. Uh, so I haven't included them in my list of valuable metal ores. So um, I hope that this video has really brought some awareness to you that it's important to keep your eyes open for discovery, for ores. There's all kinds of stories from the past of people walking past things, not thinking much of it, and uh, later someone else finds out that it's a really valuable uh, material, really valuable ore. And you don't want to leave those discoveries behind for somebody else to make. If it's going to be a, a great source of, source of wealth, then you want to be a part of that. And I hope it's also brought awareness that there are important metal ores beyond just gold and silver, or platinum, and that sort of thing. That there really are important materials. And honestly, there are people making millions and millions off discoveries of, you know, high-tech metals and other metals that we've talked about today. Now, part of being able to identify these ores is being able to recognize individual ore minerals. Um, not just every rock that's brown or every rock that's black or every rock that's white is necessarily a valuable ore. Valuable ores are rare and unusual. And so you want to be able to recognize the actual minerals that make the ore valuable. And I, so I did a series on how to recognize your own minerals, uh, how to evaluate minerals and, and recognize them as what they are. And I put a link to it up here. In fact, I did three of them. And the first one is kind of an introduction. The, and it covers it very well. The second one is uh, a, a good thing about uh, more about how to identify minerals and and what you want to look for and the third one is kind of a finish up and summary and bringing it all together and showing you an example of me identifying a special mineral some special minerals from some ores that I found in Nevada now it's been very popular this series and I'm sure that if you find this video interesting you'll definitely want to check out those three uh, videos on how to identify ores for yourself Finally, in the end, once you kind of recognize what those minerals are and uh, you think you've got something really special, something really valuable, then you want to get a lab test done. And, you know, there's uh, labs out there, geologic labs that can test for elements and that sort of thing and see if your ore really is the valuable material that you think it is. I don't offer services like that. I'm not a lab. I'm a guy. I'm a, a mining engineer who's retired. I, I, I don't do mineral ID or rock ID or uh, chemical analysis for people, but there are plenty of labs out there that do that. Now, exploration and discovery is a skill set, and it's a skill set you need to make finds. And if you want to increase your skills, in prospecting, in geology, and mining. I wrote a book about that. It's called Fistful of Gold, and it has information mostly about gold, of course, but also about platinum, diamonds, and other things, geology. There's a lot of background, and so uh, it's all on related topics, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So this is my book, Fistful of Gold. You can see it's an encyclopedia 
distilling down my 45 plus years of prospecting experience plus my degree into the parts that you need to know. I spent most of 10 years writing this. It was not just a simple effort that, uh, oh, I sat down and wrote it. You can see it's like a quarter of a million words. It's not something you're going to read through in a day or maybe even a week or more. But it's got a lot of information and reference material that you can come back to. You know, you can read it once and read it again and get more out of it because there's just that much depth of material in this. I wrote this book because I want you to have the skills to go out and find fistfuls of gold for yourself. And if you have the skills and know what you're doing and get out in the field and make a real effort, you can find significant gold. It's not easy. I'm not going to tell you that because, you know, gold, it, it wouldn't be, you know, close to $2,000 an ounce, which is what it is right now. It wouldn't be so expensive if it was easy to find. It's not easy. You just can't walk out into an old gold field and start picking up nuggets. If the, if the gold was easy to see and find, the old timers would have picked it up and taken it themselves. So you got to have skill. You got to know what you're doing. You got to be able to, to master what it takes to find gold. And you've got to have the persistence and put in the effort to find the material, to find the gold or diamonds or gemstones that you're looking for. Now, this has, book has geology, it has facts about gold, it has stuff about diamonds and platinum, but it's mostly about gold, gold deposits, how gold deposits form, how placer and nuggets form, you know, all the questions you probably wanted to ask. The book is available on Amazon, and I'll put a link to it in the description below, but you can look up on Amazon, Fistful of Gold, and, by Chris Ralph, and find this book. Now, the book, if you look on it, it has a very high rating. It has like a 4.7 or 4.8 out of 5, which is really high. I mean, it's hard to please everybody, but I'm close to a 5 out of 5, not far from it, right? So it's been out. I've sold more than 15,000 copies of this book, and I've had tremendous response, tremendous positive response by the people who buy it. And I think if you buy it, you'll be just as happy with it. Now, in addition to my book, I also have a website that I do. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my website and show you some images from the website right now. Now, my website is nevadaoutbackgems.com, and I'll put a link to the prospecting page, this prospecting encyclopedia page, down in the description below, but you can find it at Nevada Outback Gems. Uh, I sell some jewelry, turquoise, other gemstones there. Uh, I don't always keep the uh, inventory perfectly up to date, so if you're interested in anything you see, do contact me first before trying to send me money or anything, because I want you to be able to get what you order. But the website has lots of different stories, old adventures, uh, even some stories, uh, true stories from the old time miners of the 1800s. So I think it's uh, something you'll find interesting. The other thing I want to go back to is that all my comments, I want you guys to ask questions on the comments for my videos. I answer 100% of the comments that are made on my videos. Now, sometimes if somebody just says, hey, great video, I really enjoyed it, you know, I, I, the comment may just be, well, I'm really glad you liked it. Uh, or, or, you know, if it's a simple question, um, and, and sometimes I get people who ask me questions, I would take a book to answer that question, and I recommend that they just buy the book. But I answer all my questions, I try to help people as much as I can, I'm here to help you. So if you're interested in gaining the skills, if you're interested in knowing what you need to know to be successful, follow along with me. Subscribe to my channel, hit the bell so that they'll let you know when I come out with new videos and I try to do that pretty much every Saturday morning. And you'll enjoy with me, you'll come along with me, we'll have an adventure together and we will find some nice gold and see what it's really like getting out in the woods or the deserts or the mountains wherever we land wherever the gold is wherever the diamonds are wherever the platinum is come along we'll have some fun and 
I'll see you real soon on the next video.